Hello viewers, welcome back. In our last episode, we talked about the different types of fracture of the humerus. In this episode, we are specifically going to talk about the supracondylar fracture of the humerus. The supracondylar fracture of the humerus is one of the most serious fractures in childhood as it is often associated with complications. The fracture is caused by a fall on an outstretched hand. As the hand strikes the ground, the elbow is forced into hyperextension, resulting in fracture of the humerus above the condyles. The fracture line extends transversely through the distal metaphyses of humerus just above the condyles. Now looking into the various types of the supracondylar fracture, a supracondylar fracture may be of extension or flexion type, depending upon the displacement of the distal fragment. The extension type is the commoner of the two. In this, the distal fragment is extended, that is tilted backwards in relation to the proximal fragment. In the flexion type, the distal fragment is flexed, that is tilted forwards in relation to the proximal fragment. Now when we look at the displacement, commonly a supracondylar fracture is displaced. The distal fragment may be displaced in the following direction, posterior or backward shift, posterior or backward tilt, proximal shift, medial or lateral shift, medial tilt and internal rotation. The clinical presentation of this condition is as follows. The child has a history of fall, followed by pain, swelling, deformity, and inability to move the affected elbow. On examination, the following clinical signs may be observed. Unusual posterior prominence of the point of the elbow, which is formed by the tip of the olecranon process. This is because of the backward tilt of the distal fragment. Since the fracture is above the condyles, the three bony point relationship is maintained as in a normal elbow. When presented late, gross swelling makes it difficult to appreciate these signs, thus making clinical diagnosis a little bit difficult. The possibility of interruption of blood supply of the distal extremity because of an associated brachial artery injury must be carefully looked for in all cases. In brachial artery injury, the radial and ulnar pulses may be absent with or without any sign of ischemia one must look for an injury to the median nerve, which is done by the pointing index sign or for an injury of the radial nerve, which is elicited by a wrist drop sign. And when we look at the radiological examination, most often it is easy to diagnose the fracture because of the wide displacement. The following displacement may be seen on an X-ray. In an anterior posterior view, one can see the proximal shift medial or lateral shift and rotation of the distal fragment. In the lateral view, one can see the proximal shift, posterior shift and rotation of the distal fragment. Coming upon the treatment, the undisplaced fractures requires immobilization in an above elbow plaster slab with the elbow in 90 degree flexion. In all displaced fractures, the child should be admitted to a hospital because serious complications can occur within the first 48 hours. The following methods of treatment are used in displaced fractures. Closed reduction and percutaneous K-wire fixation. Most displaced fractures are easily reduced by closed reduction, but they often slip. Hence, it is best to fix them with one or two K-wires passed percutaneously under image intensify guidance. The following steps are followed for a close reduction. First, traction with the elbow in 30 to 40 degree of flexion. This is applied for two minutes with an assistant giving counter traction of the arm. Secondly, flexion in traction. In this, the upper arm is grasped with the other hand, placing the fingers over the biceps. The elbow is now flexed slowly using the hand with which traction is being applied so as to flex the elbow while continuous traction is maintained in the long axis of the forearm. Thirdly, pressure over the olecranon. 
While the above maneuver is continued, the thumb over the olecranon presses the olecranon forwards into flexion. Traction is maintained as the elbow is flexed to beyond 90 degrees. A posterior slab is applied in this position for 3 weeks. It is necessary to make a check x-ray after 48 hours and after 1 week in order to detect any redisplacement. In case no redisplacement occurs, the plaster is removed after 3 weeks. The next method for treatment of displaced fracture is open reduction and K-wire fixation. In some cases, it is not possible to achieve a good position by closed methods or the fracture may get redisplaced after reduction. In these cases, open reduction and K-wire fixation is necessary. This is also used as a first line of treatment in those fractures that require exploration of the brachial artery for suspected injury. The third type of method is called the continuous traction method. These were once used in cases presenting late with excessive swelling or bad wounds around the elbow. However, nowadays these methods are no longer in use. The supracondylar fracture is notorious for a number of serious complications and these can be immediate that is occurring at the time of fracture, early that is occurring within first two to three days and late that is occurring weeks to months after the fracture. The immediate complication may include injury to the brachial artery which may be injured by the sharp edge of the proximal fragments. Immediate complication also includes injury to the nerves where the median nerve is the most commonly injured one. The radial nerve is also sometimes affected. Spontaneous recovery occurs in most of the cases. Moving on to the early complications, Boltzmann ischemia. This is an ischemic injury to the muscles and the nerves of the flexor compartment of the forearm. It is caused due to occlusion of the brachial artery. Volkmann's ischemia is an emergency of highest order and needs immediate intervention. Let's talk about the late complications. The first type is malunion. It is the commonest complication of a supracondylar fracture and results in a cubitus verus or gunstock deformity. Sometimes the distal fragment unites with an excessive backward tilt resulting in hyperextension at the elbow along with limitation of flexion. A badly deformed elbow should be corrected. Treatment is a supracondylar corrective osteotomy. The next type of late complication is called myositis ossificans. This is an ectopic newborn formation around the elbow joint resulting in stiffness. Massage following the injury, which is so commonly resorted to in some places, is a major factor responsible for it. Whatever treatment is undertaken, the chances of the elbow regaining full range of movement is very little. The third type of late complication is Volkmann's ischemic contracture. This is a sequelae of the Volkmann's ischemia. The ischemic muscles are gradually replaced by fibrous tissue which contracts and draws the wrist and fingers into flexion. If the peripheral nerves are also affected, there will be sensory loss and motor paralysis in the forearm and hand. Mild deformities can be corrected by passive stretching of the contracted muscles using a turnbuckle splint, also called the Volkmann splint. For moderate deformities, a soft tissue sliding operation can be performed where the flexor muscles are released from their origin at the medial epicondyle and ulna. This is called max page operation. For severe deformity, bone operations such as shortening of the forearm bones or carpal bone excision etc. may be required. So folks, that's all we have for you today. Stay tuned to Anatomy Weekly. Keep watching, keep learning. We'll see you next time. Thank you.